I'm happy to introduce Henriksen. I met, I met you, I think, Christopher, last, last year, and I certainly found your presentation in Soru very interesting, very exciting, and also useful when you think of how to challenge the giftedness, or especially the talent. You talk about talent development, and you have made your research in sport. But what is very good is that you also listen to the psychological part. I will just read, just read what I have written down here. Christopher is a licensed psychologist, associate professor at the Institute of Sports Science and Clinical Biomechanics at the University of Southern Denmark. This employment includes also a specialized function as a sports psychology practitioner in Team Denmark. That is the Danish elite sport organization. And as far as I know, you travel a lot to and fro different sort of places in the world where we do see uh, sports arrangement like, I suppose, Olympic and things like that, but um, we will most likely hear that. Yeah, I think I will not read up all what is written about you. You can see yourself, but certainly Henrik has got, Christopher Henrik has got a lot of research experience on what is best practice. We talked about the gap between praxis and theory or research this morning. He do have some answers, I suppose. So let listen to how we can bridge the gap. As far as I understood, you walk to and fro on each side. So uh, welcome. Thank you. Sound? Can you hear me? Yeah, now it's on. Um, thank you very much for the invitation, first of all. I'm happy to be here. It's correct that my uh, professional life is a mix of science and practice, um, because I work at the university in this city, but also in, uh, in Team Denmark. Not only two days ago, I came back from the World Championships in Orienteering, uh, which was in Scotland, where I supported the Danish uh, national team. And I'm glad to say, you know, we had a historic, uh, historically good uh, championship. So that was uh, fun to be a part of. However, what I'm going to, um, and, and in that respect, you can say my whole professional, um, what I do is, is centered around excellence and performance. But it's in sport. And if any one of you think, well, you know, we can't learn much from sport, now is the time to leave. <laughs> so now all is suggested maybe it's because of the strawberry cake could also be the subject. I'm not sure. <laughs> but for those of you who stay, I will promise you I can, uh, I can you know, share some ideas about what we do in sport when we do best. Because we do not always do very well in sport either. But um, I was also very interested, by the way, to, to listen to Professor Plummer's talk a minute ago. And it just really struck me how far sp the sport world is from the, uh, the world of education. Could you talk about um, you know, not wanting to divide classrooms and, and in sport we sort of, you know, doing the other way around. We're slowly starting to realize that at eight years old, separating kids in terms of ability is maybe not always such a good idea. At least it has some very, <laughs> sometimes it has some implications that we do not like. Um, but I'll come back to some of that. Today I'll talk about my research, which is about uh, successful athletic talent development environments or what I've termed the ecology of talent development in sport. Um, but I'll just start, though, by saying a little bit about the nature of talent. How do we consider talent? Because there's been, by the way I see it anyway, there's been three different research waves in sports psychology research in talent development. And um, these research waves are mirrored in the practices that we do in sports psychology. Now, the first uh, wave was what I call a biological perspective on talent development. Um, basically, in this line of research, people thought, well, you know, 
talent is innate, at least partly innate. It's for the few. Not everybody is talented. Um, and it separates those who are going to you know, achieve good things later in life from those who are not going to be able to do that. And it may not be possible to see talent in full bloom when kids are maybe, I don't know, eight, ten years old. But if you've been there long enough as a coach and you have a nose for it, you'll, you'll be able to see who's got, you know, chance of becoming good and not. And in this whole research wave, there was a lot of focus on how do we, how do we select, how do we identify the most talented uh, football players, the most talented swimmers, and so forth. There was a lot of test batteries developed that included physiological, anatomical, uh, psychological measures, and so forth. Uh, I think this is like maybe around 25, 30 years back that the main research uh, was on this. However, you know, we also discovered in this research way that it's not very easy. It's really hard to predict who's going to be the next Leonard Messi. <laughs> and uh, we don't really know what to look for. We can do all these testing batteries, but uh, in effect, very often we don't, we're not very success successful in predicting who's going to be uh, elite level athletes. And this is despite of the self-fulfilling prophecy, which is that if I say, yes, yes, sorry, 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 yes, yes, sorry, sorry, it's very likely that the ones who got a yes will be best later on. Not because they are most talented, but probably more because they are giving a completely different package afterwards. More attention from the coaches, more, you know, better playing positions, more time with the ball, whatever. This kind of stuff. Uh, these two kids are from a Norwegian kayak environment. The big one here, he's one year younger than that guy. So it's not very hard to see who's going to win more championships right now. And when I asked the coach, why is he even allowed in the training community? And then he said to me, the big guy, he's never going to be really good. He's so strong right now, he just, you know, he just paddles. He doesn't learn much. He just paddles and he wins everything. The little guy, on the other hand, he has to concentrate on every little thing just to follow the big guy. So if at one point he goes boop, 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 like the other one, <laughs> then he'll have the whole package. So this is, just a, 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 this is a coach who, in practice, understands that it's really difficult to predict uh, uh, and to select talent. Now, this was one research wave. Um, then, after a while, I think actually starting with some research in chess and other areas, we developed or the, the field turned into what I've you know, termed a more psychological perspective. Um, on talent development. And in a psychological perspective, the argument is that it's not really what you're born with, it's not the innate, innate qualities that determine who's going to be world champion, it's the amount and the quality of training they do. So basically, those who win the world, med the, the, uh, world championships and Olympic medals, they're the ones who've been training the hardest or the best or the most or whatever. So it doesn't, doesn't matter so much. Of course, you know, if you have to be pretty tall to be a swimmer, stuff like this. But you know, then again, if you're really motivated, you can become another sports person in another sport. So that's, that's not uh, much of the issue. In this research wave, they do not agree, though. So, so things they're discussing is, for instance, how early should we specialize? How early should you only swim if you want to be a swimmer? And how should we have, what kind of balance should we have between uh, deliberate practice, which is hard, structured practice, organized by adults only with one purpose, to, to be better. And then on the other hand, the deliberate play, which is more of the sort of self-organized, going out, playing in the backyard, playing street, uh, street soccer, playing, and all, all this kind of stuff. And we have a, a, a number of studies showing that one road, like the early specialization, lots of deliberate practice, leads to world-class performance. We also have lots of studies saying, you know, showing that a, a much more flexible approach can also lead to world-class performance. The benefits of specializing late and not having too much structured practice in a too early age is that we have a lot less injuries and, and a lot less dropout also because the kids don't grow as tired of doing their sport as they otherwise could. This was the second um, sort of wave in, uh, in talent research in sport. 
And now I would like to sort of present a third wave. And you know, it's a little bit um, self-inflated to call it a wave already. <laughs> but this is where I sort of see the field as moving into, at least this is one of the directions. And it happens to be the direction that I uh, personally am uh, doing research in. Um, and this is more of an ecological perspective. And all of my re or most of my research has focused on um, developing the holistic ecological perspective to talent development in sport. Now, this uh, perspective sort of changes the um, focus or the attention from the individual athlete in terms of identification or selection or in terms of the amount and quality of training and onto the environment in which this athlete is embedded. Um, and it also sort of suggests that some environments are more successful than others, but I'll, I'll just come back to that. But focus is on the entire environment. This approach uh, shifts the attention. It suggests that some, some environments are more successful than others and that it simply makes sense for us to investigate these successful environments because we can learn something about how to, to create optimal development environments. And it suggests that we use a case study approach to investigate these environments and a case study approach is uh, basically investigating real-life phenomena within their real-life context using multiple sources of data. In my case, observations, interviews, uh, looking in training diaries, and like, as much information basically as possible, um, and making thick descriptions of particular environments. And, uh, and I'll, I'll give you an example of this. So this is like a, a third wave, and this is where we're going to be uh, today, what I'm going to talk about today. Now, um, to, to anchor the empirical investigations, or to, to start the, the, the research, we had to develop a framework. And in this framework, I was inspired by three main theories. Uh, ecological psychology suggested to view the athlete as embedded in a in an environment and to depict this environment as a series of nested structures. I don't know if you know Bron von Brunner's model, but it's like go basically going from a micro environment to larger and larger settings and up until a, a macro environment. Um, the systems theory inspired me to view environments as systems that have components, that have a structure, that have functions inside. Um, and cultural psychology directed my attention to the importance of culture as a sort of collective programming of the mind and to view culture as a multi-level phenomenon ranging from like national culture. It's very different what we do in perhaps Denmark versus the US or China or whatever. What would work here will not necessarily work in other places, but also micro-cultures, the cultures that exist in small teams or group culture, you could say. Um, now, this is the framework. The framework consists of two working models, and this is the first one. This is a model that allows me to describe the environments, what, what, are, the, what are the components and the structure of the environment. Um, the, the model has the, the talented or the prospective elite athletes in, this, in the core, as a core, and uh, the team or the sports team or the sports club uh, around uh, also in the core with managers, coaches, experts, and so on. Other, can you even see this? A little bit, yeah. Other components of the environment are structured in two levels, a micro level, and the micro level is where the athletes spend a good day, day, uh, part of their daily life, and a macro level which uh, does not contain the athlete but affects them nonetheless. This can be like school systems, uh, federations, sports federations, and things like this. And it's all situated in a time frame of past, present, and future because as you know, these environments are always dynamic and ever-changing. So this model just basically allows me to describe what are, the what, is, what are the parts of the environment. We also developed a second model, uh, which we call the Environment Success, Success Factors model, which um, allows us to structure the factors, the factors that contribute to the environment's success. And taking as a starting point the preconditions, uh, money and facilities and stuff, that's part of the environment, it, this model illustrates how the process of daily training, like what happens in everyday life, has three different outcomes. The individual athlete who develops and achieves uh, team achievements and team sport, and also 
sort of the development of an organizational culture. So as part of what we do in everyday life, what happens is a certain culture, group culture develops. And this idea of organizational culture, which I borrowed from, from Edgar Schein, is very central to this model. And basically, it's depicted as, a, as, as three different layers. The artifacts are things you see when you first enter an environment. What clothes people wear, the stories they tell you immediately after you meet them, you know, the buildings and all this kind of stuff. The next level is the one called espoused values. These are the values, the social principles, the goals and so forth that we show to the world. When we stand up on a Friday evening and we give a talk and we say, this is what we want to do, and you know, all, all this kind of stuff. This is, this is our espoused values. It's not always, though, that, there's a, uh, that these are very well connected, the espoused value and what we actually see in the environment. And this is explained by a deeper level of basic assumptions that are typically so integrated that we don't even see them and never, you know, just take them for granted. Um, and, the, you know, culture is, um, culture is, is also uh, organized or, or can, can be explained as, a, as an organization of basic key or key basic assumptions that govern how we do things here in this particular team or in this particular club. So this is sort of integrated into a, in what we could call a, a cultural paradigm. I'll give you a, uh, an example of this in a minute. Those were the two working models. Now we took those models and then we went out and tested them and, um, and tried to investigate. So we selected a number of successful environments. And you might not know these, but, but um, basically they are the, the Danish um, National 49ers sailing team, who, which is, a, again, a, a very successful talent development uh, environment and have produced several Olympic uh, medalists. Um, a kayak environment in Norway, a, a, an elite sports school that had an, a, a kayak environment. It was um, a track and field club in Sweden, two football clubs, one of which was the Ajax Amsterdam Academy. Um, a talent hotbed in cycling and karate. And finally, a less if not unsuccessful golf environment, which we investigated to sort of test our ideas, because if they did exactly the same things as the successful ones, we would be in trouble. <laughs> Luckily, it turned out, you know, that, we was <laughs> that uh, they didn't. So, uh, but these are the, 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 um, the empirical material that are behind what I'm going to, to talk about next. I do not have time to show, to like explain to you these environments in any detail. Since they're case studies, I have made really sort of, sort of thick descriptions of these environments. But I can give you an idea of how these um, working models that you saw before are adapted to reflect the unique features of the empirical in, uh, or of the environments that we in, in, investigated. And this first model is a model of the Wang. Uh, kayak team or the, in Norway. This was an elite sports school that had, I think, 10 or 12 different sports you could, you could uh, be a part of. And one of these was kayak. And kayak had been hugely successful over the years in, uh, in this particular environment. I, I won't go into detail, but I'll just say a very important thing here is that the center of this environment, sort of the, the, uh, the axel, uh, axis of goodness, is a, is, a, is a very, very strong link between the young, talented athletes that I uh, investigated and a whole community of former and current elite-level elite athletes. These elite-level athletes included coaches, mentors, national team coaches, uh, club coaches, and so forth. And basically, very often what the coaches did was they would just take part in training. They would paddle alongside these uh, young athletes or invite them in rather than take a classic coach role or you know, start to explain stuff or structure training. So it was very much an environment where you would share knowledge and share ideas and train together much more than it was a, a classic uh, coach-athlete relationship. You will also notice that the environment is sort of skewed to the athletic side. Not very many components on the non-athletic sides are, uh, are attributed any importance by these athletes, um, which I guess is fairly common in, in elite sport. Um, and even the school has an elite sport profile. So in this sense, you could say it's, it really is a, an, an elite sport uh, 
environment, and that's why it's skewed to, the, to this side. These athletes have a number of different relations also to other clubs, meaning that if you, for instance, in a summer holiday are going to another part of Norway and you want to train, you're more than welcome to come do that. So basically, it's not just a, this club against this club against this club. It's a whole community of Norway against the rest of the world. Um, I think there's a lot for us to learn in that, from that. When I then look at the less successful environment, the seaside golf team, um, a main result here is that, 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 you know, that there are no connecting lines between the, the, the school coaches and the club coaches, between the coaches and the teachers, between teachers and family. There's just no dialogue there. And this is actually a boarding school. So the teachers, the coaches, the athletes, they live on the same school. They have their lunch together every day and still there is no uh, integration of, of efforts. This illustrates like a disconnected environment where the only integration there is is through, is through the individual athlete. So he can say to one coach, you know, the other coach told me, and, but the coaches will not, will, would not talk together. And this was quite stressful for, for the athletes. If we look at the other, uh, the other model, the first one here again depicts the Wang kayak team. And you'll see that... Um, there's a lack of financial uh, preconditions. The environment did not have much money, but, but the environment really benefits from a very strong organizational culture, a really strong set of ideas about how we do things here at us, at, at this place, centered around an open training community with proximal role models and uh, a, a, a clear hierarchy also, but also uh, centered around openness, sharing knowledge, uh, training together, inviting people in, and so forth. This was a very strong environment and created athletes that were very autonomous, very good at taking responsibility, very good at asking for advice. So they would very often go to the best uh, paddlers in the whole world and ask questions. How do you do this and so forth? These things come together to produce uh, environment effectiveness uh, measured in terms of school, school results, but mainly, of course, sports results. Um, and again, if you look at the seaside golf team, it's a completely different story. Here you'll see uh, an, an organizational culture. Actually, the facilities were very good. They had plenty of money and good facilities, and you know, the whole school was structured that you, can, you could live there, you could train there, you could do all your stuff at the school. So the facilities wouldn't be better than this. But um, the organizational culture was extremely incoherent, meaning that there was a, 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 a gap between what we say we do and what we actually do. And this was very visible for me when I visited the environments. Um, for instance, they would say that a value for us is to create global responsible citizens that are able to enact in a, in a globalized world and take responsibility for their own training and so forth. And what I would watch when I came there was that everybody came late for training, no one warmed up for training and so forth, and there was just huge gaps. This could only be explained by these basic assumptions. For instance, saying that, you know, we are a business. We can't afford to throw athletes away just because they're late for training. Um, and also it was, a, I guess, you know, the school was sort of founded in the aftermath of 1968 and they had troubles placing too much demands on people. Uh, they didn't like that too much. Um, these were examples. Now, if we move from these examples towards more of a recipe. What we found was that every successful environment was unique. Not two environments were the same. However, they also shared a number of uh, features, or they in many ways employed the same principles in their work. And I'll now sort of go through a number of these principles, try to show you what, what were sort of the principles that these more uh, successful environments uh, um, employed. And the first one was a very sort of clear integration of efforts. And by this I mean that the teachers in the school, the coaches and everybody else would talk together. And it wouldn't be the individual athlete who would have to run around and, and you know, try to coordinate the environment. These things would happen between the different parts of the environment. Um, I love to tell stories, and I'll tell you a few. And one of them is uh, when I visited the Swedish um, 
track and field team. One afternoon when I was sitting there, these athletes would come to their coach, and the coach would say, you know, Peter, today you won't take part in the hard part because I'm of the training because I know you have a small injury thing, you know, and Sophia, you have to leave at 7 o'clock because I know you have a German assignment for tomorrow, and I know you have not finished, so you have to go back and do that, and, uh, and, and then I'd ask her, how do you know all this? And she'd say, well, I don't really know. And I said, well, I've been here a few times, and you always know, so how do you know? And, and basically what she says, well, well you know, I, I pop by the, the teachers, uh, what do you call that, where, where they have their breaks in the lunch break, and, uh, you know, just ask about, you know, and I can, I can log on to the school's uh, uh, IT system to see if they have assignments or if they have, you know. So I just, you know, just make sure, because basically what she thought was, we need to create a whole environment that suits these athletes and not just uh, focus on, you know, doing high quality exercises or, or whatever. And, um, this was very, uh, very clear, uh, uh, one of the very clear things. One of the teachers or the, the performance director at Wang, he explained it to me like this. He said, when an athlete applies for days off to go to a competition or camp, a teacher's first expression, the school teacher, must, always, uh, must never be, oh, no, not again, because I have to do extra assignments, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but always, well done. So we have to want our athletes to do well in sport if we are an elite sport school. Um, on the other hand, uh, an athlete at Seaside Golf Team, he, he, he told me this, he said, our school teachers may know what sports we do, but it's not, I mean, they're going there for three years, right? They may know what sports we do. It's not something they care about. Certainly don't uh, know our tournament plan. Our coaches know just as little about when we are loaded with homework. It's not my impression that they ever talk to each other. And this is a school setting where they meet every day for lunch. Okay, couldn't be easier. A second feature um, was actually, and this, is, this comes back a little bit to Professor Plummer, uh, Plucker's talk a, a minute ago, um, or a while ago. In, these, in sport, we have a tendency to put people very early into elite groups. You know, basically when they are eight, nine, ten, you'll have a coach after three, four days of football practice, you'll go A team, A team, B team, C team, and like this. Yeah? And it has consequences. First of all, we separate friends. Second of all, we don't really know who's going to be best after all, so we just make sure that the ones that may have become really good don't really get a chance to develop and so forth. So in sport, uh, we need to, to, uh, to, to do this less. And what I found interesting was that in these elites, in these very, very successful talent development environments, they were not very preoccupied with making small elite teams. A very open community. In the, in the track and field community, there were 40 different, 40 athletes in the age group that I investigated. 40 athletes. Some of them were national team athletes. Some of them were actually national team athletes in a different sport just taking part in the track and field training three times a week because it's good physical exercise. And there was room for that. And when you uh, ask the, the, the good athletes, do they not find it you know, annoying or boring or whatever to have, they said, no, no, no. Because when they, when, when, when they ask us stuff and we have to explain how we do stuff, you know, we, we, we actually benefit from that a lot. I don't know if, I know it's, a, so, so maybe we can sort of say that, you know, in the world of gifted education, I got the feeling that you need to move a little bit this way and we meet, need maybe to, but we are on different ends of this, uh, of this um, parameter. On the other hand, though, the coaches were very clear. You have no access to these groups if you don't want to be there. And by want to be there, I mean you come there and you train really hard every day. And I saw several times, that, or a few times anyway, that a coach would say to a, a young athlete, you know, I can see you're not really there today. Just go home. Come back tomorrow. No, 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 no. I'll be better. I promise I'll be. Go back. Come back tomorrow. Okay. So you, when you do that a few times, they learn the lesson. <laughs> um, the third one was the idea of proximal role models. And by proximal role models, I mean that the role models are not some we see, uh, people we see on television or you read about in the papers or whatever, which the elite level athletes very often are. In all of these environments, there was a clear daily link between the talented athletes, the young, the group of young talented athletes, and the very, very best in the world. So they would, they would be around these athletes every single day. They would ask them questions. In the sailing environment, 
they would ask questions about everything from training to how do you handle girlfriends, where do you borrow money for the next boat, you know, what kind of hotels do you book, uh, you know, everything, you know. So there would just be this uh, constant exchange of ideas and, and knowledge between the, diff between the elite level athletes and the young, level, uh, the young athletes. This is uh, very much in contrast to what I often see in elite sport, where there is a tendency, you know, to sort of um, make sure that the elite level athletes are not burdened by having to explain stuff to the, to the younger athletes. This is a mistake. You know, there's no, there's no need, uh, especially with the professional athletes. They have 24 hours a day, like anyone else. You know, they're not going to break because they spend 10 minutes helping young athletes. But they tend sometimes to think so. Um, another feature that the successful environments shared was um, the idea of, you know, not specializing too early, having training that allowed for diversification. It's very easy if you want your athletes to produce very good, like under 15 results. What they have to do is they have to train a lot and they have to train hard and they have to train really specialized. Only that spe you know, specific position on the playing field and certainly only that sport. If you want them to be good at 25, when it's time for the Olympics, you need to you know, em employ a different kind of principle, which is to allow for diversification. And uh, in these successful environments, they were very good at that. These are images taken from the Norwegian uh, kayak environment that I talked a little bit about before. They had their yearly basis training championship where they sort of, you know, they find the, the best all-round athlete. And this was highly prestigious to be the best all-round athlete. As you can see, you know, they were, you know, doing pull-ups and playing mini golf and walking and they were running and mountain biking and dragging big heavy rocks and all kinds of stuff. The best all-round athlete, very, very prestigious. Um, the guy who hangs there, when he was 20, he was in, he was in top 10 in, in, in the Norwegian under 20, probably, uh, championships in four different sports. In kayaking, which was maybe his main sport, uh, cross-country skiing, biathlon, and a sport where you do cross-country skiing, running behind a dog on a leash. I didn't know that one existed, but, uh, <laughs> but still, <laughs> still impressive though. And um, the coach would say to me, well, you know, he's, he's 20 now, you know, he should probably choose soon. Right? I mean, normally we, we ask them to choose when they're 12. In the track and field environment, what I saw was that organized by the local uh, wrestling team, they would have two days a week in the wrestling club because it's good training, you know, and you know, it's good to do other stuff. And the, and the sailors, again, as a, as a for instance, they will take part in maybe the Danish championships in four or five different types of boats, even when they are on the Olympic level. Because, again, it's, it's good, you know, to do different boats and you can learn different things from them. Um, another feature was a long-term development focus. So rather than wanting a short-term success, these teams were, or these successful environments, were very good at having a long-term uh, focus. And we always say this, you need to have a long-term development focus. But they also did this in practice. Um, as to give an example, in the, in the track and field environment, one of the young um, uh, runners who was by far the best in her age group, and there was the Swedish championships, and she would really like to go. But she also had a small injury, not more than any adult would have taken like a few ibuprofens and, and you know, uh, done it anyway. <laughs> but uh, but what, what, what they did was they told her, look, we know you're really good. It's not important for you to win the Swedish championships. You have to be good when you're 25 and you're going to the Olympics. So, you know, just stay home, relax, get over that injury. And the best part was before they told her, they phoned and discussed this with the club coach and the national team coach and the parents and the school teachers and whatever. <laughs> so that wh whoever she would ask, they would say the same thing to her. Because that's not an easy decision, you know. But they would really do that. Um, there was a room for what I could say called free initiative. And by this I mean that if you want to train, you can train. You don't mean, you, you, you never meet like a locked down classroom. Sorry, physics is over. You know, or you, you, can't, you can't step on the grass kind of thing when you're at football training or whatever. You know, there was, it was always possible to go to training. And if you were in one team 
and you had to go to the dentist at 10 o'clock where you were meant to be training, you can train with the other team at 12. Now, even though you don't belong to that particular team, you're more than welcome there. And this was sort of in all the different environments very clear. No one who wanted to train was not allowed to or not given the opportunities to. And then, and I talked about this already a little bit when I presented the two environments, then there was this idea about a strong and coherent organizational culture. And basically what I mean by this is that there's a big correspondence between what we say we do and what we actually do. Um, this is not always the case. I see that very often in different environments that we say we want to be the best place for kids to be, you know, friends and train together, you know, but we still do ABC teams, not uh, looking at who is friends with whom or whatever. Um, so, but in these environments, they really did that a lot. These images or the pictures here are from the uh, training facilities. So the training facilities were really sort of low standard. Uh, on the other hand, in this uh, training facility, the strength and conditioning room, there was this paper clip, newspaper clip, and here it says, um, old heroes never rust. And there's a, an image of the newly um, Olympic champion who just came back uh, only a short time ago from Olympic uh, championships with a gold medal, and he's rowing the Norwegian, or paddling the Norwegian championships together with a 65-year-old guy who used to win medals, you know, in world championships many, many years ago. And what he says to this paper is, I can still learn a lot from that older guy. I'm not sure he really could, but that's a very strong signal in a culture where you want athletes to learn from each other and, and things like this. And it doesn't stop even when you're at the Olympic level. Uh, another feature was the idea of openness, sharing knowledge. Elite sport can be extremely secretive. Coaches don't want to share their ideas with other coaches. Athletes don't want to share their secrets with other athletes and so forth. What I found in all these environments was actually the opposite, you know, that everybody was sharing knowledge all the time, you know, and, um, and coaches meeting in groups, athletes meeting in groups, just to share knowledge as much as it was possible. Um, and uh, one of the sailors, you know, presented like this, he says, you know, as sailors, we are a national team, but we are also competitors for one spot at the Olympics. Right now, for instance, in the 49er group, we have three boats in top five in the world. One of them gets to go to the Olympics. But um, we are the only nation who, who uh, to solve this dilemma by working together, and I'm damn proud of that. And still today, I know that these uh, three boats, they do all their training together. They do all their evaluations of the training together. Even though, you know, <laughs> three boats and top five in the world. Um, and then there was a focus on, you know, developing not only the athletes as athletes, but as whole persons. You know, basically saying that when you are part of this environment, what you should take away from this is not just to be a good paddler or a good sailor or a good track and field athlete, you need to become a good person. Um, so they were very, you know, preoccupied with what is it that we want our athletes to learn by being in this, in this environment. Again, a, a sailor explains it like this. You are here on your own initiative. Developing your talent is your own responsibility. No one invites you. No one holds your hand. You have to kick the door in, and that's how it should be. So these athletes really learn to be proactive, to seek you know, advice, to come up and say, can I be a part of the evaluation meeting tonight? You know, is it okay for me to take part in the training? Things like this. You know. And they, so they become quite strong in terms of social skills. Um, here's another quote. Again, this is also a picture for that basis training championship I told you about before. And when I asked uh, Erik Veros Larsen, the, the, the gold, uh, Olympic gold champion, he explained it to me like this. He says, they learn to acknowledge that there are no shortcuts, only hard training. No money, only sacrifices for the sport, and never enough time, only efficiency and discipline. And that, I think, pretty much wraps it up, right? <laughs> a bit hardcore, perhaps. <laughs> but, but still. So these were the features that were shared among these, uh, these environments um, and sort of like a, a recipe. But bear in mind, though, that uh, this is a, a world conference. And as I, as I presented before the empirical background, you might have seen that it's from a very narrow geographical area, right? It's Scandinavia and Holland, basically, the Netherlands. 
so, so we, we still have a long way to go to see uh, how these successful environments are culturally situated and how the culture you know, may uh, mean that you know, the workings of successful environments might be different in different cultures and different countries. Um, allow me just to, uh, to, to, to provide like a short link uh, or a bridge to applied sports psychology, which is also my field. Uh, and I just want to show you that, that uh, the whole idea about these uh, notions of talent has a, has a very, very big impact on how we do uh, practice. And basically, if you take the biological perspective and you say, okay, talent, who wins the next world medal depends on, you know, the innate capacities. What you'll do as a sports psychologist is you will try to, uh, you know, develop test batteries to select and identify and find out who's the most talented and who's not, because we don't want to spend resources on athletes who are not going to be good anyway. So this is sort of the general idea if you take that perspective on, on what athletic talent is. Uh, if you take a, a psychological perspective, you would say, well, you know, a winning mindset or a strong, or to be mentally strong is something we should develop in uh, targeted exercises. So we would say, well, you know, fair enough, some are strong mentally when they come here, some are less so, but they can all be taught to be strong. So we want to make uh, exercises, we want to do workshops and so on, that sort of enables these athletes to become stronger and stronger from a mental perspective, just like we do in physical training and technical training and so forth. This is, this is basically the idea that has been prevalent for the last maybe 10, 20 years in sports psychology. Um, and if you take this more ecological perspective, you would say, well, mental strength or a winning mindset doesn't necessarily have to, to grow out of uh, or, to, or to be a product of, of targeted workshops. Maybe it could simply sort of grow out of the culture that is, as, that is the daily uh, training environment. So, so basically, if you are in an environment where you are, where you're not, uh, no one holds your hand, and where you have to, if you want to become good, you have to ask someone who's better than you to share their knowledge and share their ideas. And so then you build strong social skills. If you are in an environment where, you know, um, people keep sending you texts, remember there's training today at 3 o'clock, you know, and doing everything for you. And when you get there, your shoes are washed and your clothes are folded. And this is not science fiction, man. This is what happens in the football clubs you very, very quickly learn that, you know, I can just sort of lean back and hope for best. And you will never become good. So, so and then we can do whatever we want to in our workshops as sports psychologists. It's not going to work <laughs> if, we, uh, if the culture sort of uh, doesn't collaborate. So, so, the, so, the basic, um, so the basic message there is that it's not unimportant how we see talent. It makes a world of difference. In, in terms of sort of the uh, applied work or the, the practices that we engage in. I just want to finish by presenting a, um, a definition of talent. I know that you are probably far ahead of us in terms of uh, terminology and definitions. And, and I know, and in sport, uh, we, have a, we have huge problems uh, in terms of this because in, in one study, you could say, what differentiates from a mental perspective the best in the world from the next best? And you will say world, ch uh, world champions and Olympic champions will be the best. Those who participate at the Olympics but don't win, they will be the next best. But then in the next study, you will say everybody who goes to the Olympics are best. So, so the ones that are control group in one study will be you know, part of the elite group in the next study. And this just means that it's one big mess when we have all these different... Uh, um, uh, you know, studies about a winning mindset, for instance. But I want to just, you know, present a, a different um, definition of what talent is, and, and, and uh, I find this to be very helpful. So if we define it from an ecological perspective, talent is a set of competencies and skills that are developed on the basis of both innate potential and training, or multi-year interactions with the environments, training and competitions and so forth, as well as the ability to exploit the strengths and compensate for the weaknesses of the environment and to contribute to its development. 
And I think this is something we overlook very often. We have athletes that are maybe very strong in a physical perspective, you know, very talented from that, but they're not able really to go into the environment and they, don't, they can't really contribute. And um, if someone doesn't hold their hand or if they're not reminded to do all their exercises, you know, they don't really get to do them and so forth. Um, so I think maybe we are overlooking the idea that part of being talented is also part of being able to go into a group and get the maximum out of it. And, w and what doesn't happen in that group, maybe I can compensate by finding it somewhere else. So if my coach is not very good at this particular aspect, I ask someone else for help in that aspect. Um, yeah, that pretty much wraps it up. And um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was a wonderful, inspiring, and interesting. We are not individuals on our own. We can, in fact, work together and support. And the environment means a lot. And you means a lot for the, for the one you are sort of training. Anyway, a few questions. You are welcome to. I, you have the microphone. Thank you so much. So. Uh, when I saw him a year ago, he jumped into the water in Soru Sea just to keep fit. Was it after or before the dinner? I don't know. But anyway, you came back. <laughs> yeah. I'm just taking a swim, he said. It was dark. <laughs> <And> <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Um, I'm a principal in Bangkok, and I have been working in the Thank you for that question. It's a really good question, and it bridges also the gap to the applied work. And I can tell you, um, for instance, when I, I've been to the Olympics, for instance, or World uh, Championships and so forth with athletes many times, and I have never, never met an athlete who didn't have serious self-doubt before uh, important competitions. And I think some of the problem is that uh, we talk about it as if you are mentally weak if you have doubts or if you, you, know, you, you, don't, you don't feel confidence. And basically what happens you know, in the last couple of hours before an important race is that you start thinking you're not well enough prepared, you start looking around, you see your competitors, everybody else looks so strong, you know. You start uh, doing your warm-up exercises, for instance, and the other ones are running faster than you. So you start speeding up your warm-up exercises even though you've worked meticulously and you know exactly what kind of zone you really should be in and so forth. All of this is just going on in your head. It's one big mess. And what we do in, in the national teams that I'm a part of is we talk a lot about how natural this is. This is there all the time, and the, the objective is not to take it away. It's to ask yourself, okay, I do not like this particularly, um, but what do I want to stand for? What person do I want to be in this, in that kind of adversity and and so forth. So we, we basically, uh, you know, we train it. We have sessions where we do uh, mindfulness exercises, for instance, training, you know, the ability to register all these different thoughts and emotions that come around when you're about to do something important and um, different diffusion techniques that we can then use, you know, to make these uh, thoughts take a little bit less of a hold in us. And then we discuss values with them a lot. So, you know, that life is, you know, the good life is not the life without worry. The whole, it's a whole life. It's a life with worry and achievements and looking forward and all that stuff. And who do I want to be as an athlete? What do I want people to say about me when I finish? Kind of, those kind of questions we, we spend a lot of time on in, uh, in the applied work. And uh, much more than we try to maybe get rid of uh, uncomfortable feelings or uh, you know, worry or self-doubt or lack of confidence. And, you know, th that's part of the game, basically. So, and I think this openness is, is extremely important because um, sport can be very macho. Yes? Can you tell us a bit more about um, the condition uh, long term? You explained about uh, a young
young girl who had uh, an injury, and I understood mm. that. But as you grow older, the long term becomes to get shorter. So, yeah. do you understand my question? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's another thing that I would like to do more of in, in terms of developing this research. Right now, the research has been sort of very snapshot. Okay, so we take a, an environment with athletes who are between sort of 16 and 18. We look at this as an environment and we, and we can sort of say, okay, th these are the features that make sure this environment is successful. What would be really cool though would be to, to follow um, environments across time to see how they also adapt to adapting demands. Uh, I'm quite sure that a successful environment for 12-year-olds will be different from the ones that are 16-year-olds and also an elite sport environment at the very top level where performance is a demand like on an everyday basis almost. Uh, there will also be differences in terms, of, uh, in terms of what are successful environments at these levels. But I do not, uh, I do not uh, know. What I do know is though that we have a huge problem with dropout uh, from sport um, that very often is not because they're not good or not becoming better, but because they are suffering injuries, because they are training too much of the same and they sort of get bored, it just becomes too much. They're giving up too much. So already when you're 14 years old, your, your, your coach will tell you, oh, you know, if you're really an athlete, you won't go to your mama's 50-year-old uh, birthday or whatever, because you know, a, a real athlete will prioritize training. But by 14, man, you know, put a little bit of goodwill in the bank, you know, you're, you're going to need it later, you know. Um, but, but definitely these environments will develop over time, I'm sure. I don't know. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. yeah. Fine. Fine. <clears throat> a few more minutes, then you will get a cake. <laughs> all, 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 the good good ones, all good things come to those who wait. George Harrison album. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you. I, I really liked your presentation. I have a question about, uh, you mentioned early specialization and deliberate practice versus late specialization and deliberate play. Yeah. Um, does it somewhat depend on the type of sport? Um, because, for example, like gymnastics, that's typically a sport where it's a young sport, and girls in particular, they peak really at young ages. Um, and I see, um, I have a daughter who's in a talent development program in gymnastics right now. She's only seven. Yeah. And they want her to practice four hours a day, five days a week. I have some concerns about that, but it seems to be that the way it is, at least for mm. gymnastics. Yeah. What are your thoughts about that for, you know, across different sports? Uh, that's, the, that's actually the way we talk about it today. What we say today is, you know, um, late specialization is good for some sports, but it wouldn't work everywhere because there are sports where you need to peak early. And those will have like a different kind of setup. I would like though to question that logic a little bit because it's true that's the way it is today. The same goes for swimming. I c come from a background of swimming, so I can relate to that a little bit more, but it's sort of the same thing. If you do not swim really well by seven or eight, and you're not already on the competition team, and say you are 10 years old and you come to a club and you say, you know, I want to try competition swimming. There's no way in hell you'll ever get a chance to even try. There is no spot. There's someone better than you and you, you, you won't be able. So what we basically say is you have to start early. Yes, you have to start early right now because the structure is like this. But it's not necessarily because there's an open window of motoric development or whatever the arguments might sometimes be. I want to, you know, I want to question that, I, that idea. And um, for instance, in badminton, I know that in Asia, the, the model tends to be badminton is an early development sport. You need to develop really early. You need to do like you do in gymnastics. I can just tell you that Denmark has also some of the world best badminton players, and they are all best when they are like 28 to 32. This is more expensive because 30-year-old athletes, they want a car and they want a mobile phone and all that kind of stuff. So in that kind, you know, it's, that's terrible. But, um, but we've proven them wrong, you know. So in all youth championships, we are like far behind. But when we go to the Olympics, we take medals every time in badminton. There might be one more question while you, we, we are about to finish. Do we see any transfer to the cognitive development, to the cognitive sort of, or to the emotional? 
Uh, oh, that's a big. Uh, that's a big. Uh, there are research groups that are investigating this on a very high level. You know, uh, um, I think it's too. Uh, for me, it's too early to say if, if okay. doing sport will uh, improve your cognitive ability. We would abilities. like you to look into that and invite you next time you've got a. <laughs> you should invite someone else. <laughs> paper because it's quite interesting. But this sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, any more questions? Fine. I think without this one, short. Yes, short and sweet. Because we have to give him a present from the World Council and the local committee. Thank you. In your speech, you spoke about the, uh, the role that parents play mm. in, in the United States and also in other places around the world. Parents are often very um, aggressive when it comes to supporting their individual athlete. This is mm. also true in education. Yeah. We see a, a great crossover, and I wondered if you might make some comments about having parents see uh, more than just their own child and yeah. have a more global view. Yeah, I'm really glad you say that because I, I can completely recognize that picture of uh, parents. Um, in these environments, we tended to see that the teams or the clubs that we investigated had a very uh, sort of sharply formulated policy on, on parent involvement in sport. And those would typically mean, um, for instance, there would be a policy saying, you're welcome to go to a competition, but you will be given a task that, in, that is for everybody. Like you're the one who makes lunch to everybody, or you're the one who, whatever, you know. So, so you're, you're not allowed to come if you only focus on your own kid. And, and th this was... Um, and, and, you know, they, and in the sailing environment, they actually had a, a, a policy of actively keeping parents away. And I remember, I've got to tell you this story. I remember this one particular episode where a very, very talented young Danish sailor, she was on a development team and not receiving quite as much fund, as, as much money as the parents would have liked. So the, 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 the you know, the the mother would call in and say, you know, she's ready to go to the next level and she's ready to go to the senior team. And, blah, blah, blah. and then in the end, what the coach or the, actually the manager, the sport manager of the federation would say, I'm sorry to this girl. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to take you off the national team because your parents are not yet mature enough for you to be on that team. <laughs> and she really did, they really did, you know. <laughs> so she was off the team for half a year until she rebelled enough to say, look, just leave me alone so I can sail. <laughs> so do take an ecological perspective, it seems, <laughs> yeah. including the parents. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much.